change the subject, but I've only been on one venture in the Smoky Mountains. I'm, I'm going to start yeah. doing that. Oh, really? It, the first thing that I saw, because I've studied on what to look for, and what I didn't want to do was automatically say, oh, man, I'm, you know, make it look like that that's it. You know, go looking for things that was going to be like, um, uh, you know, just uh, made up, you know what I'm saying? And the stuff that I saw, man, was like completely freaky to where I was like, if I even <laughs> if I told you, uh, I, I don't know if you, have you been up to Abrams Falls yet? No, I've heard of it though. Dude. So like, if you go the right, if you make a left at the fork and you go the regular way that we've always went. Yeah. Uh, I've never went the back way. Um, so I, I took the back road, uh, you know, along the river. And uh, I seen this tree that was like laying over and it had been bent and it had another tree laying on top of it. Pinning it down. Pinning it down. And so I was like, crap, this is what these people have been telling me about. <laughs> so honest to God, God be my witness. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to promise to God and not and, and not tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to tell the truth anyway. But um, I walked up to where the tree was at. I had my camera with me. And so I'm standing there. And I'm just looking around and I, I look over about a hundred yards, <clears throat> like up this gorge. And on, I, I promise to God, it looked like a bear's face looking at me. And really? I thought, okay, I'm seeing stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm completely freaked out right now. So I'm making myself see stuff. And so I'm standing there and I'm like, okay, <clears throat> I really want to go into the flat mode, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, that's gotta be a bear. And it was just far enough away to where you could just sort of make out that it was like, a bear mm -hmm. you know you see the, the the fur on it and everything and i'm like and it was just behind this log when it's his face was on top of it just looking at me and it wasn't moving at all and i'm like okay i'm absolutely seeing things i'm, I'm like freaked out i've been listening to all these shows and you know <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm standing there and uh all of a sudden i hear this like uh i felt it more than anything it was like this uh, this growl and so i'm looking up the hill and on the camera, <laughs> you see, I'm, and I thought for maybe it was like a plane, a far, a real low hanging, roaring plane. And all of a sudden it was like, it just shook me. And I'm like, holy crap. And I took off down the hill and I went across the road and across the road. Um, and I've been on this little trail before and I walked about, uh, I would say 50 yards to 75 yards toward the, the river. And they was this round, completely round bowling ball looking rock, white, the only one. And it was laying at the foot of a tree and they was all of these pine branches laid out like a bed and they were snapped. And I thought, okay. And so I'm looking at the pine branches and I'm thinking, okay, so these are just blowed off a tree. The closest pine tree that had those branches on it was like 75 yards away. Hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe the gust of wind blew them all, but are they going to blow it in a complete, and I've got, I videoed it and everything. I'm like, are they going to blow it in a complete beautiful bed, you know? And, and it looked like the rock may have been, I don't know, some kind of weaponary thing. I don't know, not that these things would need it, but yeah. So I just freaked out, dude. I got out of there. What, when did this happen? <laughs> this happened last year, uh, probably around March, uh, I would say March, April, something like that. Yeah, I moved here in April. Yeah, so it was, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go back up there, but I'm taking somebody with me next time. Heck yeah, man. <laughs> so Heck yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. I got to get, I'm taking somebody with me that I can outrun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a one-legged person on a cane or something. Mm -hmm. I hear you. <laughs> but yeah, it was the first time I went up to looking for anything. And I've been in the woods all my life. Like in the story that I'm going to tell, uh, you know, until I was 12 years old, I was raised in the Appalachian Mountains, you know, uh, in uh, coal mining country. And I hunted, I was hunting by myself from the time I was like seven, you know, taking a single shot 22. And I never, the only thing I had, uh, you know, get on me was like a bobcat or a, you know, a, you know, a mountain cat, mountain lion uh, was tracking me. But that was the only it, only experiences I ever had. That is that is one of the most terrifying things for me when I go in the woods mm -hmm. is I'm more scared of mountain lion mm -hmm. than Bigfoot. Yeah. And, and, and it's it's just because, man, <sighs> there's no doubt in my mind mm -hmm. those mountain lion are there. And oh, yeah. I won't know they're there until they're ready to kill me. Like, mm -hmm. like Bigfoot, like 
you'll see the face or yeah. you'll see a shadow. You'll hear it walking. Mm-hmm. You'll, it'll play yeah. games to toss little stones at you. Mountain lion, yeah. forget about it. it yeah. It's a rat. Like when you know it's there, it's because it's on your neck. Yeah. I, and the way that I was trained, uh, he was like my granddad. Uh, and he, I was going hunting with him and my best friend. We, me and Shannon, we grew up together, you know, and, until we, I moved away. Uh, he taught me how to fish, how to hunt and everything, uh, how to track. And he was like, you know, when you're on these cliff faces, when you're walking in the bottom of them, look up, he said, and, mm. and, and keep, you know, you're, you need to look up more and you need to look out because, you know, they're going to, if they're going to get you, they're going to jump on top of you. So mm-hmm. I always try to stay away from those cliff faces just because I, I would go around them and go on top of them or yeah. something. So I, I, I never really wanted to take the low ground. Mm. And uh, I was taught that from a very young age. And it was one evening, I was probably three miles back up in the mountain. And I was about, I guess, eight, maybe nine years eight old. Eight years time. old. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I was about eight. And uh, times are different back then. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, uh, and I was leaving. And it was starting to get dark. Uh, and I knew that it was going to be dark before I got off the mountain. So at that time, I had my second gun. My dad, my granddad got me, my real granddad got me a uh, 20 gauge. And okay. so I was like, uh, you know, I had it loaded and everything. And I, I looked, I thought I heard, you know, you feel something following you. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, uh oh. And so I thought, well, maybe it's a bobcat and everything. And I, I didn't, I didn't see it at, at first. And then when I glanced back, I could see in the clearing because there was trees on both sides. And I seen it run from one side to another. And I thought, oh my gosh, dude, that's like a, that's a mountain lion. And we used an outhouse back when I was a kid. And mm-hmm. it, one actually jumped on top of the, uh, on top of the outhouse and you could hear it wagging it's flapping it's telling it scream like a woman so it was you know i've had different run-ins with those Jeez. but i mean it stayed on me and i would just take and <laughs> i had several shells you know and i'd i'd load the gun up and just fire it behind me just to keep it back off yeah. of me. and i would just i dodged it that's and, wise yeah. yeah so i just kept on going and that's he always told me if you know if you feel something's going on use your shells to create some you know get yeah. it off of you and uh, i made it out of there luckily so that, uh, yeah i i um so we are, our puppy has been born for about two weeks and we got about another six weeks before we can pick it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have, um, I have a hunting dog. Uh, well, I, I guess they're show dogs too, but they're good hunting dogs too. Uh, German short hair pointer. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, we're getting one of those in a few weeks and uh, I'm really excited about it. And I'm, and I'm going to be taking the dog with me when it's older to uh on these films and stuff that i'm doing i don't know do you know much about me i, I don't even know mm-hmm. uh okay so um th- before we go any further uh we're recording right now and i'm just going to keep it rolling uh because you started talking about bigfoot like i just want to record this so right. normally I, I have more of a formal introduction to the guests but uh today we'll just uh kind of keep it rolling but i just want to let the people know uh your name is glenn yeah. and uh and you and i just connected on the computer to do an interview and i said where are you from and it's a common question i ask people just to kind of break the ice right and you're like uh knoxville and i was like shut up <laughs> and so i was like come on over to the studio and so we're doing it here in person and uh your story that you emailed about uh is is a wild story mm-hmm. and so i was like this is better to do a person anyways yeah um because well i'm not going to spoil it but uh, it's it's a wild story uh but what was i saying before that i forget what were we just talking about your dog uh the dogs thank you see this goes all over the place in my mind um so we i have a a, a media company uh merkel media mm-hmm. and uh we're doing films uh more like we're taking uh certain episodes right now at least it's going to change and evolve over time how we do things we're going to have more people involved eventually i'm not even going to be in films i'm hoping hopefully i have a, it gets to a point where it's just like we're pumping out content people show show for the content not just for me to be on video um but for now what we're doing is we're taking some of the episodes that i put out where it's just like whoa that was a great episode it would be awesome if we could go there mm-hmm. and we're going there awesome. and so we're shooting films and stuff and i think it'd be a great element to have my dog on scene for an extra scent and, and stuff like that since uh you know dogs see see things they smell things uh and you know that comes from the paranormal side with the bigfoot stuff and and all these other creatures that walk out there to the natural side of things with like bobcats and mountain lions i just had a bobcat walking up my driveway last week and i was yeah. just like look there's a bobcat and my mom's like really i'm like yeah it's, it's going up the driveway yeah. <laughs> and so i i just i love living here the only thing i don't like about east tennessee and i don't know if it's like this 
everywhere, or if it's more like an East Tennessee, West North Carolina area thing, is man, I am really sick and tired of smelling skunks. Like they Get used to it, man. I was like, <laughs> I like so. I mean, we have skunks in Pennsylvania, <laughs> but like when when I when I tell people that aren't from here, I'm like, no, listen, like the thing for roadkill here is skunks. Like you are guaranteed to see a skunk as a roadkill somewhere on your commute. Yeah, that should be the uh, the skunk in East Tennessee should be, or in Tennessee in general, should be the state animal. It really should be because that's all you 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 know. I know at work if I'm working nights, you, the first thing that you do is look out the door when you're going out to do a round to check and see if uh, you know if you got one because a lot of the, sometimes you can't smell them, but if you walk up on them. Oh, you'll you smell them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And right now I heard it's mating season. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's just like, I was driving my son to school yesterday morning and we get, we got here into town and I said to him, does it stink in here? And he's like, yeah. And I go, what does it smell like? And he says, skunk. And I was like, all right, let's just make sure it's not my imagination. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like this aura. And it's just like, you're going through a skunk field or something. I don't know. Yeah, but, it, that's that's got to be uh, that's got to be an animal because I don't live by the liberal anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, we we kind of changed the scenery. Um, yeah, I, I just but everything uh, everything else about this area I absolutely love, and right. it's just been an absolute uh, blessing. And um, it, it's been a cultural shift in the sense that I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, but for the last uh, since I was seventeen years old, thirty seven now. Um, I've lived in the Philly area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, living in a more rural area is new again for me and I had to adjust to it, but it didn't take too long. The biggest thing I had to get used to was um, where I lived before, every direction I went, there was at least a gas station within two to five minutes. Right. Everywhere. Now the closest one in my house is at least 15 minutes away. Oh yeah. And I'm just like, dang it, but I actually kind of like it too. You know, <laughs> I got a lot of cows around me, yeah. you know, so... Um, but anyways, uh, Glenn, you, you contacted the show with a, a very wild experience. Now, you grew up in uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know you kind of popped back and forth to Virginia and, and spent some time in Florida, I believe, and then you moved back to Virginia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so how long have you been living in Tennessee, by the way? I moved to Tennessee when I was uh, 18, almost 19, and okay. so it's been 33 years now. Okay. Uh that's where I, I mean, me and my wife, we dated for six months. We eloped, ran off to Virginia, got married, moved to Florida, stayed for about, you know, five, six months. Until the parents calmed down? Until they were, <laughs> that's it, honestly. I until I knew it. I wasn't going to get shot. <laughs> this is East Tennessee. And yeah. I know how they work. Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, um, well, that's another conversation, probably not for even on the airways. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I've learned about some areas here in East Tennessee that's oh, a no-go yeah. zone. Uh, so, but, um, so when you were a kid though, and I'm glad you actually, I'm glad I hit record when you started talking about your childhood and uh, the, you're talking about hunting and the, the mountain lion, because it kind of, what you just did there was draw a picture as to what the world was, what the culture was, what the environment was that you specifically grew up in. And when you mentioned you lived in an outhouse or not lived in a house, <laughs> yeah. you, went, you, you had an outhouse where you lived. Yeah. Uh, it it kind of draws the picture of how, how rural your upbringing probably was. Yes. Um, and so when you're telling this story, I hope people can, you know, take that visual and say, okay, he's living rural. And then where he went was probably even further out, you know, mm -hmm. to pick the berries and things like that. So, yeah. um, when you were a kid, you had a wild experience. You weren't the only one to go through it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hand it over to you and let you try to start to draw the picture out and tell people what happened. All right. So I was going to read off my thing that I sent you, but I don't, I, it, I don't need to. Okay. Uh, we, my dad, first off, before I tell the story, uh, I, want to, I want to say this. Um, if there's people out there, and I don't mean to be offensive to people. People's got their own religions. You know, far be it from me to tell them what to do. But if you, for if you have somebody, or well, let me say this: if you practice any kind of witchcraft, Wiccan, white magic, whatever, if you practice these, it's not. It, this doesn't just affect you. This uh, becomes what I call a generational curse. What you've done to your bloodline is you. You basically contaminated it and uh, this will follow generations of your family until 
they have enough uh, uh, education to break that curse uh, because this stuff is real. This is not something you play with. I know people pull out Ouija boards. They do all kinds of stuff. But this stuff, this stuff is real. It's as real as God because, I mean, he created the uh, entity that, um, that causes everything, which is, the, you know, the devil. But um, that's just my take on it. Mm-hmm. I- I'm telling you. This this and the there's reason, a reason there's a reason why you say it too. Uh, there's a, a definite reason that I say it, and, yeah. and this all. So we were like I said, we I was raised in uh, just a coal mine town in Oakwood, Virginia, and Dad would work in different mines based off of where the work was at. You know, he may go to Joel Ridge, he may go to different mining towns to work until they had a layoff or go strip mining, um, and that's what all my uncles did. This particular time, we was we moved from, uh, and he was a pastor uh, in a church. Uh, he he pastored the whole time, pretty much. Uh, I was there when my dad got saved when he was when I was mm, roughly four years old, and uh, so him and my mom both preachers. Um, we uh, on, on this particular trip, we went to uh, Hayside, Virginia, and we. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I get squirrely. That's fine. So, That's fine. So, uh, so this was when I was about nine years old. Uh, we moved to a little coal mining town in Hayside, Virginia. Uh, my dad was working at a strip mine at that time. And again, that's where all my uncles worked. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, he was a pastor and, uh, we're out of Oakwood, Virginia. So, uh, while we were over there, we were staying in this little old bitty trailer park. And my mom asked us one morning, she said, I need you guys to go and pick some, you know, blackberries uh, because I'm going to make some blackberry cobbler and different things. And we thought, you know, it was only sweets we got because we didn't have a lot of money. And we were like, oh, man, that's awesome. So we were all excited about it. It was me. I'm the middle child out of five children. And my aunt was with us, my mom's sister. And she was like, you know, can you guys go up on the mountain and pick up some, you know, or go find a place that has them. So we went out on the hunt, you know, and we ended up getting to the bottom of this uh at the bottom of this mountain, um, and it was it was nothing but a switchback road going all the way up. I don't know if you know what that is. I don't. But what this, so the mountain is just too steep to go sh- from oh, the bottom to the top. it's a zigzag? So it's a zigzag gotcha. road. Gotcha. I call it switchback. I call it zigzag. <laughs> and so in between this, the, there's little plots of grass on every single switchback, mm. but we could see the top all the way up there and because it hadn't, it, the foliage wasn't high. So we ended up going, it took about 30 to 40 minutes to climb because it was so high. And it was, you know, my little brother at that time, he was probably four. Uh, My middle sister, I mean, my younger sister was right below me. She was about seven. And then my other sister, she was uh, about 10. And then I had another older sister that was 11. I mean, my parents, it was pretty much in a row. Yeah. And then my, my, my aunt, she was about 16. Okay. Well, we, we finally made it to the top. And it was jackpot, man. I mean, we we seen these berries. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, the heavens opened up. So we started picking berries and we separated. So I had my baby sister with me and they all picked somebody and they were all with each other. So one of the first things that I knew that this wasn't right is is that feeling that you're being watched. And I've been in the woods before. I know when something's stalking you, when something's looking at you, because previously as we talked about it. Mm -hmm. So I had this, my, my alert was up. And, uh, so my sister was over there. She was probably eating more of the berries and she was, you know, putting them in her bucket. And, uh, about three or four feet away from her was this snake that come up as a black snake. And this was the weird, cause I've dealt with copperheads, uh, you know, garden snakes, you know, you name it, I've dealt with them. <clears throat> and this snake was weird. It, it fanned out like a cobra and it was black and its eyes uh it were shaped more like a human it wasn't like like a snake you know it, but its pupils were reptilian but its eyes were like big enough to where it would move its eyes around hmm. and i thought man that is like something i've never seen that and i like i said i've ran into many snakes in the mountains and so it's just looking at my sister and so i grab a hold of her and pull her back and as i'm moving her back that thing you know instead of dropping down it like went up and dove and where it would, it wanted you to see its whole body. And it was like, it went forever. Like, I don't know how long it was. Like it jumped. 
it didn't like jump, you know how it would just wave and go down. Yeah. And you can see its whole body. And it was like it went forever. And it would, all of a sudden, it would come up another, you know, we'd go 10, 15 foot and it would come up and it would be looking at us again. And I'm at this point, I'm like freaked out and it done it again. And it was trying to go around us. And so at that point, I just got her. I grabbed my baby sister and I ran over and joined the rest of everybody. They were congregated uh, at more up on top of the, even further out. When I got there, we come up on this graveyard and it had this iron uh, fence that was built around it. And it was painted like white, but it was chip paint gone out of it and everything. And they were looking at something like intrigued. And so I got over there and I'm looking at what they're looking at and it was this glass coffin now this is where it really gets the snake thing was weird but this is when it gets crazy inside of that glass coffin was this uh this guy and he had jet black hair and it was combed all the way back he had on a cloak and the uh the collar on the cloak was turned up uh and inside, and you could see the inside the cloak, and it was like this purple color, violet, purple-ish color, real pretty. And the uh, and the shirt was like this really frilly shirt, and I think in the letter I said it was like the 1600s, mm-hmm. like if you were in the 1600s. Um, and uh, he had his hands on his chest crossed, and his fingernails were black, jet black. Oh, weird. And he had rings all on his on his hands, all this jewelry. And he had this medallion on his neck. And it was hanging uh, right above his hands. And in the bottom of the medallion, it come around. And it literally spelled, and I know your, your people are going to be listening to this. And but I promise to God what I'm telling you is the absolute truth. It said Dracula on the bottom of it. Well, I'm sitting there and... I got cold chills. I'm like, okay, we need to, we need to get out of here because there's stuff in the mountains in the mountains. And I don't know if people may have told you this or they don't, but there's a lot of Celtic magic and all that stuff, you know, from people that's come across the sea, you know, come, mm-hmm. come across the pond. And, uh, I don't think that this was that kind of magic, but this was evil, whatever mm-hmm. it, I mean, it, you know, it, who believes in Dracula? You know what I'm saying? Vampires. I mean, well, I believe in vampires. <laughs> Sesame, Sesame Street, you know, I, I believed in, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. vampire. But in my mind, yeah. that was just all sure. until until that day. And then all of a sudden, I'm trying to get us out of there because it's like, you know, it's time to flight. And out of nowhere came this, and this is where the story gets even crazier. Out of nowhere, this guy shows up and he's about, I mean, of course, you know, I'm small, but he's the tallest dude I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And uh, so, I mean, he's he's probably looking at, uh, I don't know, six and a half, seven feet tall. He's just huge. I barely came up to his waist. You know, if that tells you anything, that's how big the guy was. And uh, so, and he had this black dog with him, this, uh, this Doberman Pinscher. And it was a massive Doberman Pinscher, like... The, the dog's back come to his waist. So it tells you how big the dog was. Mm. And it had this uh, mucus that was coming out of its mouth. And it just, and at this point, I was probably, again, three to five feet away from it. And I could smell the stuff coming out of the dog's mouth. And it was just, it was like if you threw up. I mean, I hate to be gross, but it yeah. was like if you threw up and you're smelling this uh, wretched, you know, vomit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just like froze. I'm 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 so petrified. I'm like, but the first thing that went through my mind was, my gosh, my family's gonna, it's 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 gonna kill my whole family, you know? Because at that point, I had to become the guy because I was the only guy, and you just want to, you know, that's the way I was <laughs> yeah, raised. Yeah, is you got to protect your family, and so, uh, he looked at us, and I looked into his face. And he was wearing this uh, old hat, looked like an Indiana Jones hat. And I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, you may have listeners that live up in that area. Maybe they've, and one of the reasons I wanted to 
to come on and, and talk about this was to see if anybody else had seen this. That's initially how you reached thing. out to me. You said, yeah. you said, have you ever, have you ever had anybody on your show or talked to somebody that has seen this? Yeah. And you didn't say about the Dracula thing. You said about a guy in the woods with a dog. Yeah. And I think I said, it sounds interesting. You want to talk to me about it? Yeah. And so he was wearing this old tattered, like leather jacket that come down to about his thighs. And he had, I remember what he was wearing and it was brown and he had on this uh, greenish tan, pear, you know, earthy colored khakis on. Mm. And he had on, I remember looking, because I, I don't know why that I was looking at his clothes, but I was so freaked out. I was I maybe trying to get my mind onto something else. And uh, I seen the brown, like uh, old shoes he was wearing. And so I looked at his face and I, when I say his eyes were like marbles, black marbles, they no pupils, nothing. It was. I guess it would be all pupil. It's just, it was very uh, glossy and black. Mm. Uh, and the dog was the same way. The dog had, it was just black, glossy marbles for eyes. And uh, I remember him asking, you know, basically, what are we doing here? And, but when he talked, it wasn't like a single dude talking. It was like, when he talked, it was like 50 people talking at the same time. Like if, if you, if you could imagine a, a legion of, of voices at simultaneously and, uh, which completely freaked us out, you know, we were already freaked out enough and I'm like, Hey, uh, we're just up here picking, you know, berries from my mom. Uh, we didn't mean to uh, bother anything or mess anything up. Uh, if you, you know, let us leave, you know, uh, we'll go. And so, and at that time he hunkered over and he was looking at me in the face, you know, and I'm like shaking yeah I, I shake when i think about it you know because it was that uh, you know that was a long time ago and so we all just i just told everybody you know go back out the way we came and i didn't ask at that point i'm i, I didn't ask his permission i'm just like we got to get out of here and so we started back out the way we came and we got to the top of the switchback road and out of nowhere he was there again and so, and he was standing sort of at the entrance of the first where we would go in on the road. And I stopped and we were looking at him and my, you know, sister's crying and, you know, my aunt was freaked out. And so he's standing there and uh, he's holding his dog back. And uh, I said, buddy, I said, if you'll let us leave, I said, we will never, ever come back up here again. You know, we, we didn't mean to do any, anything. We didn't mean to cause anything. We, we just up here picking berries again for a mom, if you'll let us go. And about that time, and I guess he just wanted to show, show off or show what he, this dude turned into this thick black smoke and his dog. And they went to the, they didn't just float to the top of a tree. It's like they were, it was controlled. And they shot to the top of this, uh, well, not to the top, top of a tree, but up to the, like a, a low hanging branch, which would have been about, you know, 35, 40 feet up in the air. And then they reformed and the dog was sitting on the branch and this dude was standing up there beside the dog and he was holding on to the tree. And we, we were just stunned. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know. I just knew that this was, uh, we were scared to death. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody... At that point, that's like, this is not even human. And before we could really, and we wasn't going to say anything. We wasn't trying to say, we wasn't trying to communicate with each other. We were that scared. Like we didn't know it was hopeless. Yeah. You're in a bad situation and you got a long way down that hill and you ain't going to make it. And this dude turned back into smoke and his dog and they come back down there. And one of the things, and I mentioned it in my thing that I wrote you, and I guess it was trying to. I was keeping my mind occupied on something else because I was so af afraid. His hat was still up in the, up in the tree. And he came back down and he had this, uh, his, his hair was like white, you know, and it sort of just hang down. But it, I mean, it's just funny that he left his hat up in the tree and, and we're like, just, and, and I'm begging at this point. And I said, sir, please, you know, let us go. We'll, we'll, we'll never be back. And he hunkered over. And he looked at me and I mean, when I say gazed into my eyes, like the back of my head, he was looking at, 
He said, if you ever come up here again, I'll kill you. He said, I'll kill y'all. And I was like, you, my word, we'll never come back up here again. And so I told my sister and everybody, I said, go. I'll stay up here. You guys go. When you guys get to the bottom, I'll head down that way. So I'm staying there with him. And that dog, he's just keep holding it back. And he's pulling that dog back. And he was like, and I didn't know if he would just break his word and go ahead and get me. But it, it, it was what it was. And I seen that they got about three quarters of the way down. And I thought, well, that's, that's far enough down. I'm, I'm, I'm taking off. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't take the, just the road. I mean, I skipped over uh, the middle where the grass was. And I just kept on going down. And every layer that I was going down, he was meeting me at. I, I, I would look over to my left, and he was at every single. Just standing there? Just standing there with him and his dog. And at some point, he quit doing it. I, I don't know how far. It must have been halfway down, maybe uh, about three-quarters of the way down. And then he, he didn't do it anymore. And then I got down to the bottom of the end of the road, and they were all down there freaked out crying and screaming and i looked back to the main top we could see all the way like i said always to the top and they were standing at the top of the a mountain him and his dog were just standing there looking down at us and we just went home we never spoke about that for 37 years none of us mentioned it ever again because it was so frightening not even to the parents no wow no we 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 didn't talk about it because we thought if we talked about it then it would give it Mm. this it would follow us or whatever call it and so we ended up just, uh, uh, you know, just not not speaking about it. And then it was 37 years later, my sister had moved to East Tennessee. She's back in Florida now. And we were sitting around and all of us were finally around each other again because it was, you know, 20, uh, 25 years since we've been around each other, mm. all of us. And uh, we were sitting in the living room and I was like, okay. Because I thought, you know, maybe I, maybe I dreamt this. Maybe mm-hmm. this is like a bad, because you want to think you really didn't see that because we didn't talk about it we didn't have it in conversation so i said i i want to talk about something and i said do you guys remember going to uh you know pick berries for mom and hayside and they were like uh, up, up on top of the mountain and i said do you mind remember seeing anything crazy and my sister spoke up and she goes uh you mean the guy uh that was in that glass coffin and i'm like yeah and i said what else did you see and my brother spoke up and he was young. He said, I remember the big old dude with the dog. And, and then my sister spoke up and she said that turned into smoke mm. and like went to the top of a tree. And we're all sitting around going and we're all like, I thought I imagined that mm-hmm. because we literally didn't speak about it. And I'm like, no, that really happened. We didn't all just have the same dream. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we, we actually seen this. The only person that we did not correlate our story with was my aunt and was but, she there okay. uh, she was there with us at the time up on top of the mountain right but not on the no, recollection no no okay. this was just all the five kids together okay but we all recollected the same exact you know story mm. uh, maybe one didn't remember the hat or something like that but yeah. you're talking you know 37 years later everybody's still sort of piecing it together but it was all insane and uh yeah that's that's what happened with that and The crazy thing was when my baby sister had her daughter, um, uh, Lord, this would have been in 97, uh, I went to see them and it always, it, I never forgot it because it was always in the back of my head what we saw. So I'm a very, uh. Uh, I'm I'm a type of person that uh, I like to investigate stuff you know, <laughs> yeah. to make sure. Was you really? Are you really nuts? <laughs> you know. So I had one of my my best friend that you know his dad taught us how to hunt and everything. He, uh, I asked him. I said, Shannon, you want to go over and take a trip over to Hayside with me? And he was like, Why do you want to go over there, dude? That's like, you know, thirty five forty minute drive. And I'm like, I got something I want to see. I said, You want to want to go over there? And he was like, Okay, I'll go over there with you. And he had a four wheel drive. And it had the cage on the front, you know, mm-hmm. he's a big hunter still, you know. And uh, so we got over there and we started going up that road. And I told him, I said, stop here. And I said, I want you to make a right right here. And he was like, dude, there's like little trees and stuff that's grown, brush that's grown up there. I said, on the other side of that is a road. And he was like, you are, 
And he could verify this. I mean, this actually happened. And uh, he said, you're crazy, man. There's nothing on the other side of that. He said, it's, it's, it's little like trees. It's, you know, one, two inch little trees. And I said, it's not, I said, I'm telling you, there's a road on the other side of this. I said, you know what? Forget it. I'll just get out and I'll walk it. He was like, no, nah, no, nah, hold on. So he locked his truck and four wheel drive and everything. He pointed in there and we drove right through it. And right on the other side, I mean, a foot on the other side was this, but was this, uh, was this road and we got on it and it was the switch back road. We went all the way to the top. When we got up there, the, um, the graveyard was still there, but nothing, there was no marked graves or nothing. Was there marked graves before? Yeah, they was like, uh, from what I remember, I seen these little stones, you know, there was about, uh, I don't know, a foot, a foot wide and they were, I didn't go read them, but you can tell that there was, you know, other people that had been in there, you know, and, but the one that I was fixated on is, you know, basically Eddie Munster that was laying in, you know, in, yeah. a, in a glass coffin and he was like, dude, how did you know this place was up here? And though, so I told him the story. I said, so he said, wait a minute. He said, so you promised this thing. You wasn't going to come back up here anymore. And you haul me up here. He <laughs> said, you pull me, <laughs> he said, you pull me into your family's craziness. Yeah. And I'm like. Well, dude, I just wanted to see if it was here. He said, you should have drove over here and done it yourself, man. He said, now you, I'm in this. So he sort of got a little irate with me, but. Uh, At least he believed you. Oh, he, <laughs> well, he knew my, my family and stuff. So yeah, yeah he, he didn't doubt it. So we, uh, yeah, that was a, that was an issue that, uh, that, that really happened. That was. Wow. So you, you, when you go, went back up there, there was no Mark Graves. Uh, mm -hmm. you, obviously you didn't see the guy or mm -hmm. even Dracula guy in the coffin <laughs> when you looked in that grave as a kid did it look like a fresh dug grave it was it, it was weird because it was it was uh it looked like the hole wasn't deep enough mm. so i don't know if there was something that was you know holding the oh. holding it up uh but it looked like it looked like if you threw dirt on it it wasn't going to cover it up you know like it you know because you need six feet of you know mm. drop it down in a hole but it was almost level. <clears throat> it was almost like level with the ground, if that makes any sense. I I don't know if maybe they had it held up or suspended. I didn't look in, close enough for that. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at a a human being exposed to you know. And I've been to funerals before because you know being a, a preacher's kid. Uh, but this was the weirdest. It was the weirdest thing. I don't know how it was suspended. I I just know that you've seen more, and you could see the dirt around the sides of it you know but uh, that was it i mean it, it no so it wasn't like something that was there for years it, no 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 this was i mean you could tell that this was we had this is what i think i think we walked up on a ritual of some That's sort what i was just thinking and maybe instead of uh, dracula maybe it was like more of a warlock uh in i don't know you know, that's, that's me speculating. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know what it said. I know what he looked like. And, uh, and I know we probably walked in on something that people are not supposed to see. Yeah. And we got a good, but for some reason, we've always seen stuff that you're not supposed to see, you know, and, and I, and I go back to the opening statement. This is stuff you don't play with because it's once it's in your bloodline, uh, you open your family up to, you know, to some crazy stuff all because people are, you know, they're selfish, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, they're always the, the knowledge of wondering if something's, you know, what else is there? Mm -hmm. What's the unanswered questions? You know, my granddad was a, a necromancer, so he could summon, uh, you know, demons. I mean, he was, he, he right out of the book of black magic, you know, I mean, it was, he was, a he, he practiced, he would practice witchcraft or be a warlock and go preach in churches. Oh, he was a pastor. No, he was just a preacher that would go and preach in different churches. A in, preacher in holiness churches. So that's what I'm saying. Like he was a, like proposing as a Christian preacher. Yeah, and he would practice and uh, mm. you know witchcraft. Mm. Uh, and and the reason I know, uh, I mean, I heard stories from my mom. My mom was in a book called The Cry of the Innocents. She was a uh, uh, one of the chapters uh, that she was in, and they they done a story. Uh, about her uh in one of the chapters it wasn't her book they just interviewed her mm -hmm. and uh it was cry of innocence cry of the innocence or cry of innocence and it was a book 
and uh, she told me about it. And uh, she would tell about how, and when she told us, I mean, she told us a lot of, a lot of gory stories about her dad. So he was doing it while she was growing up. Oh, he would take her to, he was the kind of guy that would take his kids and that was how evil he was. He mm. would take his kids and put them in a deep freeze and uh, sit on top of the deep freeze and he'd stack them in there like firewood. Uh, he would, uh, I remember one time she told me a story that he had taken her over to this house and, uh, and he would do these, uh, ceremonies with these other guys and they would, my mom would be the, you know, you, you talking about pedophilia, uh, and she would be involved. She, he would make her involved in all that at four or five years old. And she, she told me about a story that she seen this cat that was starving over at this house that she was made to go to. And she wanted to take care of this cat. And uh, her dad was like, I don't even like calling him my granddad, but uh, her dad was that's like. What, in, the, in the message, you said my mom's father. Yeah. And that's why. Yeah. And so uh, she said, can I take this cat home? And he called her some names and said, no, you leave the cat. Where the kid, it was a kitten. So she didn't listen. And she took the kitten and wrapped it up in her shirt because she was going to feed it little bread, a little bit of bread and stuff. And she got it home. And he heard it. Uh, meow in the back seat so he pulled the covert car over on the side of the road and this, this come from my mom and he made her take her shirt off and he wrapped the cat in the shirt and he beat the cat to death against a tree and just blood and everything in it and i know this is no you fine. know this is uh it's but uh, this is the stuff that she had to live through mm -hmm. and um so then he he told her you know this is your fault you killed that kitten because you wouldn't listen and then he made her wear the shirt. And, but this kind of heinous uh, stuff that he did with the, you know, to his children was just, it was, it was nonstop. It was uh, until he got so old that they, and they had like 17, 18 kids or something. <sighs> uh, he married my grandmother when she was, or went with her when he was, she was like 12. Mm. And uh, so it was. Uh, Things were different back then. <laughs> It's good, bad back then, but it's also bad back then. Yeah, uh, the way women uh, a lot of the times were treated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in children and stuff, and what people were gotten, you know, what the you know you get now with social media today. Uh, thank goodness, a lot of people get caught doing stuff like mm -hmm. that. But yeah, that's the kind of things. And uh, you know, I remember when I was like four, um, she still tried to love her dad. She wanted always wanted her dad to love her. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that they were having a you talking about hogs. Uh, they were having a hog killing over in uh, in West Virginia. It's where they um, it's where they're from. Um, where that's they, they have they're, they're they're branched out. Part of their family is from uh, from Ohio, and then the other part is from West Virginia. And so she took she took me over there with her to you know spend time with my cousins and you know aunts and uncles and stuff because my dad didn't like them. He didn't like being around them. And uh, didn't like being around what her family. Oh, her family. Okay, yeah. And uh, so we got over there and this was, uh, I don't know, it was night and they had, they had killed a hog. And I remember, I remember him seeing them put the hog head in the oven. You know, I, I, I never got into all that, but mm -hmm. uh, he had this stairwell that was like a three story house that I think his dad or somebody had built. And um, by trade, he was a brick mason, but there was this three story house that we were in. And all the kids sort of got trapped in the bottom of the stairs, you know, like trying to scare us or whatever. Well, I'm a very inquisitive person, you know, have been since I was super small. And um, I was four years old, maybe five at the time. And I looked up and I seen this person sitting up uh, on the on the top floor. And I thought, that's one of my uncles, you know. And so I thought, I'm going to go up there with them. And so I got about to the second floor and I looked and there was nothing. It was just a, a open room with nothing in, in it. It was just open. And I went on up to the next level. And by the time I got up there, they had let all the other kids out, you know, at the bottom. So I'm in there alone. And when I got to the top, I put my hand on this person's leg on their, on, on its knee and to pull myself all you know, the rest of the way up. And as soon as I touched its knee, it was like if you held a, an ice globe or, you know, a, a piece of ice in your hand for like five minutes, mm -hmm. you know, this, it just 
all the way up to my elbow. It just locked up and just hurt. And I pulled my hand off its leg real quick and I got up. So I'm standing beside it and uh, it was very pale, like if somebody had drowned, you know, no skin color, like almost bluish pale. And uh, if you touch it, it was like that kind of cold. It was immediately. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking at it and it's, it had real long black hair, stringy black hair. And it's, it's, it's uh, mouth was like very uh, uh, contorted. It had these uh, jagged teeth that was showing through. It, 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 the mouth wasn't big enough to hold the teeth in. Mm -hmm. And it had this nose that was turned up. And it was like uh, slits and it almost looked like a pig, but it wasn't. I mean, it didn't turn up that much, you know, and it had these eyes that were real slanty and but it didn't have any eyes in it. It was like black again, black. You know, I don't know if it was marble black. I was, you know, but the moon was shining in from this big window and um, I looked out into the room and it was a single table with a burning candle. And it was just, it was a table with just with a candle on it burning. And this thing, it would make these fists. It was squeezing its fist and you could hear like bones and stuff popping, you know, like, like grinding. And it was doing this growl to where it, you know, like if you're listening to a real low subsonic bass and it, it, like if you're in your car and you know, you're, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, it just rattled your whole chest like mm -hmm. real low and it made you like queasy almost it and it was omitting this low growl and it just it literally froze me and i'm i was like locked on it and it wasn't moving its head it was trying to move but it couldn't and something in my head said you need to leave now go back downstairs now and as i was going down the stairs it kept telling me get downstairs don't look back go downstairs now and so when i got down to the bottom of the stairs i kicked i remember kicking the door because i was you know at this point i'm freaked out because i heard a voice like somebody talking to me hmm. i seen what i saw and again it had that wretched uh pukey smell to it like it smelled like somebody just threw up sour like the dog just like the dog wow and so i'm i got to the bottom and then all of a sudden my mom's dad he opens up the door and he says uh he called me a you know b-a-s-t-e-r he said what's up you little you know mm -hmm. he said uh the next time you go up there he said i'll let that effing thing eat you and so, so he didn't even try hiding it no, nothing there was no none of that and so i got out of there and he told me he said now go in there with your mom so I walked in her mom. I said, Hey, I said, you know, Papa's keeping something in the top of the top of the house. It's a monster. And she was like, you need to stay down here with me. And I remember, wow. I remember late that night, it was making this commotion in the top of the house. It's like chains. And I didn't see any chains when I went up there, but you could, it was like somebody slapping chains or something on the, on the, at the top. And it was making this huge commotion. And it was like this growl and, and he, he hollered out something that wasn't even like, you know, if, if it would have been English, I would have remembered what he said. Yeah. But he, it, it was almost like uh, hearing it in my head, it was almost like Latin or something. And he uh, basically told it to shut up. And it didn't make a noise after that. Mm. So it was insane. I mean, that was my first cousin. I could taste, oh, sorry about that. Yeah. But I, I could tell you story after story about this kind of stuff but uh that was the that wasn't my first exposure to it my first exposure to it when i was about was probably maybe a year before that and we were uh we were living on top of the hill where my my dad's parents were at and my grandmother at this point had already passed she died with a, a, like a leukemia or a blood disease and um uh, before you go any further, so I, something I didn't even think about is your grandmother, his wife. She she was married to him. Was she involved in all this stuff? At no, all? no, she was abused just as much as the gotcha. kids were. Okay, that yeah. I, okay makes sense. Yeah, she she was afraid of him. Uh, yeah, I would be too. But she she ended up she she was a you know from everything that I knew about her, uh, she just 
a good person in a really, really, really atrocious situation. And so I, I have nothing bad to say, you know, about her. Sure. Um, and don't, don't get me wrong, other than what my mom's dad had said to me, he was never, he never hit me or mm. I was never around him. Mm-hmm. I only had one confrontation with him when I was about 15. And he was like, come over here and give your grandpa a hug. And then uh, I, I can't even tell you what I told him at that point, you know, because I was old enough at that mm-hmm. point to where I was like, <laughs> you know, it yeah. was, it was pretty bad what I told him. Yeah. I mean, I, I my grandfather, uh, my mom's dad, uh, if he was still alive when I was a young man, mm-hmm. I would have beat his face in. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the first thing that went through my mind. Of course, my cousin, which is, he's dead now. Mm-hmm. My first cousin, uh, you know, he was, at, when he was 15 years old, he was probably six, four and he was scared to death of him. Wow. I mean, that's how evil the guy was and the stories that we had heard and, mm-hmm. you know, from different family members. So, uh. I mean, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty terrible. But the, the first time that I had ever got a, a glimpse of the supernatural was when I was around four, uh, maybe, maybe right before four years old. And my sister, well, my older sister was about five, six, maybe six years old. And my, and my next to the oldest sister, she would have been just a year older than I was. We had a, a neighborhood girl that was watching us. And, uh, we were sitting in the living room watching TV cause my mom and dad went off shopping, Christmas shopping and they took my little brother, but my younger sister, my baby sister, she was at my aunt's house. And I remember all this. I remember where everybody was, you know, it, even I was very keen minded, even at a very, very young age. Uh, and we were in the living room and we heard this baby crying out of the, uh, mom and dad's bedroom. And I'm thinking, what? And I said, is, you know, is, is my brother, is, is he here? And they're like, no, she, they took him with him. And so I'm like, wow. So they're sort of getting, they're like freaked. So I get up and it was in a trailer and you have to, after coming out of the living room, going into the kitchen, you go into the back bedroom and you've got this, um, is, is my mom and dad's master bedroom. And so I went through the kitchen and as soon as I got into the, where the door was, where you go in, the baby quit crying. I'm thinking, man. So I thought, okay, maybe, you know, maybe it's a toy. Maybe it's something crazy because I, 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 you know, it was, uh, so I walked back into the living room and they're like looking at each other and they're looking at me and they're scared. And, um, I didn't realize it, but my sister had already seen stuff too. Uh, How old were you again? I was probably right around four years old. Four, okay. And, but you got to think I was four, probably going on 10. I understand. You know, That's how I feel about my son being five year old. Yeah. Cause I mean, I was already out playing, running the mountains and everything when mm-hmm. I was that age. Um, and so the only thing that I was afraid of back then was rain. That was it. I, I was, I was scared to death of water. I was really afraid of rain. Mm. But, uh, as soon as I walked back into the living room, um, it started crying again. And I was like, what? So I, no fear. Mm. I walked in the, through the, through the kitchen into the back bedroom. I walked in, it was still crying. And so, uh, it was coming from the closet. And so I, you know, the panel closets, you know, the old trailers, mm-hmm. I pulled the, 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 open the closet door and it was just clothes hanging. There was nothing in the floor, uh, except shoes. And I was looking around and, and I was like, it was like, is anybody in here? And all of a sudden it quit crying. And so that sort of got me right there. Cause I was like, Whoa, Mm. You know, because they didn't have <laughs> voice activated baby dolls back then, you know. <laughs> so um, I, I walked back in because this was like 1974, 1975. And um, so I walked back in. And as soon as I got back to the into the living room, they were already like standing in the hallway going to the other end of the trailer. And that baby started crying again. Mm. And they shot to the middle bedroom, all of them congregated in the middle of the bedroom. So I thought it, 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 what it did, it made me mad. Because it was like a harassing, you know, sort of bullying, picking on us. Yeah. So um, I'm a little ignorant hillbilly, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I run back in there, I swing the door open, and I tell it to shut up. And it shut up. It didn't say nothing else. And I, it didn't cry after that. But that was my first experience with, uh, with the supernatural was Ben. Wow. Holy cow, man. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, crazy stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, this stuff 
has kind of it, does it does it plague you today at all or because I know you said in the beginning that you said you're a Christian mm-hmm. uh, does does that uh, I don't know at what point in your life you became a Christian but mm-hmm. was there any correlation of ceasing of activity in your life around that or no after uh, I mean I had had supernatural experiences but not what I would consider uh, you know dark. Mm. Uh, like I would, you know, when I become a teenager, there was times that my life was saved. Uh, there was a time we were pulling out of a, me and my best friend, he's dead now. Uh, well, I, I'll give you two different uh, situations that happened. Um, my best friend in, in Florida, we would always go out and we'd party and he would be like, man, as long as I'm with you, he said, uh, I know nothing will ever happen to me. He said, because uh, your mom's a woman of God and and you're protected. Well, this guy wasn't a Christian. He didn't go to church, nothing. And the reason he said that was because about a year before that, me and three of my friends were standing in the house and my mom came up to us and she said, I want you guys to be very careful. Uh, I seen in a vision that there was a bad car wreck and one of you are going to be laying in the bottom at the the bottom of a car. You're going to get ran over. And, uh, so my, my, my friends were like, yeah, your mom's a little, uh, a little strange. And about a month went by, maybe two months went by. And my, one of, another really good friend of mine, Eric, he was changing a tire at the end of my road and a car, it transitions from sand to asphalt. And so the car was speeding on a dirt, sandy dirt road in Florida and it started fishtailing. And it, when it hit the asphalt, it was trying to correct itself. Eric was on the back uh, driver's side changing a tire and the car ran right over top of him. And it had, he had pins in his legs that like to kill him. And he was hanging out the bottom of the back of the car, which is exactly what my mom saw. So he was like, oh my gosh, anytime that your mom says anything anymore, I will be very mm-hmm. cautious and stuff. So that, that actually happened. And, and again, I think that's, God was using you know, that, uh, it, the, what was in my mom that, you know, and still is, uh, to warn, it was good. It wasn't, uh, you know, dark magic. It was, she's a preacher. Well, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and I think once, once you're, if this is in your bloodline, uh, and you have somebody like my mom's dad that practiced it and was dark with it, I think that the supernatural you're going to have to deal with at that point, it's, it's going to be either good or it's going to be bad because yeah, I mean, it's in, it's, it's part of your DNA at that point, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you pray the curse off of you and whatever, uh, whatever you have, it, it, I, I believe that God will use it to your good. Um, because you've already been subjected to so much stuff anyway, he doesn't have to, <laughs> yeah. he said, you've already, you've, you've been on the ride for a while. And so he, uh, uh, you know, he ended up surviving and, uh, Frankie, uh, he would always tell me, you know, Man, you, you, anything ever happens to you, dude, uh, if I'm with you, nothing's going to happen to us. So I remember he was working at KFC and <clears throat> I got dropped off at where he was at because we were going to go out partying when he got off work. We got out into the uh, park. He got off work. We got in the parking lot. We were rolling one up. And he was like, uh, you know, we're going to go out to, uh, you know, the bluffs. And uh, we've got some people out there we want to meet. I'm like, cool, man. So we come out of the parking lot and it was a four lane highway. So we were going to shoot to the medium and make a left to go in the opposite direction. Well, we shot in the medium and we were driving this old Ford Courier truck, you know, and he made a sharp left and the door opened up on my side. When it opened up, I wasn't hanging on to anything. I, I was actually holding a, a, a joint, mm-hmm. <laughs> rolling one up. Yeah. And my hands wouldn't hold on anything. And I went out the, I went out the truck. I was about, uh, my knees were probably clearing the threshold of the cab and there was a semi right behind us and uh all of a sudden i felt this hand on the on the lower part of my back it is this hand and it just put me on it you know and it pushed me on top of him and we were in the truck yeah and we were making a, a turn wow and it threw me in on top of him and it slammed the door shut now if the if the, you're making a left, the door is not going to slam shut. It's going to open up to the you know outside. It slammed the door shut, and he was like, 
dude, how did you get over here on top of me? I said, dude, I don't know. Something put his hand on my back. He said, that's exactly why you were here with me all the time. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so it was probably after I got married, I was, I was gone from Florida um, probably about three years, maybe, maybe four. And he ended up, uh, he ended up, uh, he was buying trailers and start, starting his own trailer park. And he hit a line, a gas line, mm. and it covered him and set him on fire. And he lived for a couple days and he ended up, he ended up passing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, and he went to church with us a couple of times, you know, and he was very intrigued by it, but I wasn't that kind of guy that was push religion on people, you know, cause I wanted to be cool. You know, yeah. I was a PK and, you know, everybody knew that. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to live a different, you know, I was trying to go away from that. You yeah. know? So the more rebel, that's why PKs are, there's two reasons why PKs get into a lot of trouble. Number one, PKs are pastor kids, by the way. Anybody listening? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, most of them have a call in their life. And the second thing is, is they want to run away from it. You know, uh, but the, uh, when I say a call in their life, you know, the dark side, the devil knows what, uh, you know, what, uh, the, you know, is, uh, is, uh, you know, the, if you got a call in your life or not, too. You know, it's, you know, you, you, you look at different, one of the biggest things, and I don't mean to talk about abortion and I, you know, this is, <laughs> but I think a lot of, I think a lot of major ministers and extraordinary people have been killed, uh, because of that, you know, and, uh, you know, that they tried to kill Jesus when he was a newborn. They tried to kill Moses when he was a newborn. Mm -hmm. They're going to get you at the first of it. That's where they want to get you. Mm. Uh, so you don't complete your task, you know, your, your fulfillment in life. And so that's. Uh, I think that's always been a thing, uh, I think, with my parents' children is uh, you, you sort of get a bullseye on you. But, I mean, the only thing I can say is this. That was the first time since I was a child that the supernatural really uh, affected me. And it was in a positive way. It saved my life. Uh, I have a lot of friends that's, that's gone. Uh, and for some reason, I made it out uh, alive. I didn't think I'd ever would because, you know, I've, I've had people, friends of mine that were 14 years old, we'd be getting drunk and they'll dive into a, uh, you know, a place called the 20-footer in, in Dade City and uh, with Lacoochee River and never come back up. Mm. You know, uh, car wrecks, uh, getting burned up with gas, you know, a lot of them in prison, you know, and it's just, uh, but God had other plans for me, I guess. And, uh, so that's, uh, so there, there's a lot of different times that I've, I've been, uh, driving down the road, fall asleep. I, I drove a truck as well. A oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I was, I was heading over to, uh, uh, South Carolina and I was pulling a, uh, a dry box, uh, is empty. I was going over to pick up some furniture and I'd been, I was coming from Delaware and, um, uh, I was just dead heading it over there. And, uh, I fell asleep and I heard people hollering at me on the radio. I mean, the, 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 the tractor and trailer was off the emergency lane, tilted sideways, and there was a bridge coming and I'm, I'm dead asleep, just gone. When mm -hmm. I woke up, my hands were off the steering wheel. I'm sleeping. And I heard people screaming on the radio and I, I just grabbed a hold of the steering wheel and just pulled it. And it didn't jackknife, it didn't flip, it popped me right back up on the road, uh, probably about 200 feet away from hitting that bridge head on. Wow. And that, that, that's happened, if, if my life would have ended most of the time, it would have been in a car crash. And I've been, that's not, there's several other times I've been saved uh, from being killed in car crashes. <sighs> it's like that, going to work one morning, fell asleep. And you've been in Knoxville, mm -hmm. uh, Cedar Bluff. They were doing Cedar Bluff. They had the actual Cedar Bluff uh, from the interstate. It was just gone. It was just a big hole because they were going to reform it. Mm. So it was like a 30-foot drop-off. And they had cones to block it with lights, flashing lights. Well, this was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I was going to work, and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I was probably 100 feet or a, uh, about 100 to 200 feet from going off of that ravine. And my hands were again were in my lap. I was sleeping and something was steering the car 
back out onto the interstate. And I grabbed a hold of the wheel and finished it out and was like, wow, that would have that would have killed me. You know, God's in heaven. And every time he hears you close the car door, he's like, oh, here we go again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, hey, Angel, go just go follow him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I told you about when I went to see my sister uh, have her baby and me and Shannon, that same trip, uh, I was going to get off on the Abing- Abington um, exit and it had like 36 miles to go before I got to the Abington exit and I had worked a double so because we couldn't I needed the money mm. and uh, so I worked a double and I hadn't been asleep and I remember seeing the last thing it was like 30 something miles I woke up on the side of the road on the side of the interstate car running stick shift hands in my lap uh, the car was just sitting there running 40 something miles past the exit you have no so idea. I, I drove 70 miles and no recollection of it, nothing. The car was still running and, uh, and it was, uh, I was, I woke up and I was like, where am I at? And I ended up driving, it was, uh, 40 plus miles past the, past the exit. Unbelievable. Yeah. So it's, wow. so that's just time after time, man, that. If 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 I was gonna if I was gonna go, it would have been in a car wreck. Yeah. And God just kept his hand on me because he was like, you know, I still got something for you to do. You not fulfilled your call. So you know, um the life of exciting stories you you shared here, uh you're probably just gonna die a boring death. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's hope. <laughs> it's gonna just be like, oh yeah, you just went to sleep one night and just, just wake up. <laughs> I, I pray for that. I, I, I don't, I don't want to have to suffer through cancer. I don't want to have to go through any kind of extraordinary thing. I just, I just want to go in my sleep nice and peacefully. Yeah. Pray before you go to bed. Make sure you're, you give it that last hoorah. Yeah. Forgive me for all my sins, Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> please, please, please. Extra <laughs> let, let, please. Me, let me double up on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, wow. a, it's a, it's a, it's been a, it's been a trip, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, the road that, that he's had me on, uh, I've witnessed a lot of stuff, you know, and I think there's probably a reason. Uh, or there's definitely a reason that I'm still here. I, I think that, you know, and I don't, I don't definitely want to get off subject or anything, but I, I believe that people that can see what's happening in society today, we are the very people that are going to help uh, people and uh, to, to help people sustain. I think over, yeah. I think there's a time coming very shortly Mm -hmm. that and i don't know how long it's going to last but we've the people the the powers that be has been trying to divide this nation over every social issue you can think of whether it's racism sexuality whatever the time is coming to where we are going to be so divided as a nation that it's divide and conquer and it's 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 coming and and you know my wife and i we we ended up buying a uh, a farm and we we built this huge barn, and we thought, oh, we'll, we'll do a wedding venue. And all of a sudden, it's morphed into, and we were just talking one day, and I was like, this is because we got a freshwater, you know, spring pond that's spring-fed. We've got uh, freshwater uh, in, a, in a well behind us. Uh, I've got all kind of animals, you know, to mm-hmm. eat. Uh, and I told Lisa, I said, you think this place might be like an ark to help people? Mm. In the last, you know, as this, as it gets bad. And she said, yes, I, I do. So, you know, building it as a, a venue or building it as a, a, I think it's more, we're going to focus now toward sort of like an outreach and have praise and worship services there, make it more of a religious, religious experience, mm. but prepare for what's coming because rest assured. It is coming. Mm-hmm. There is no dodging it. Yep. It's like if you could see something. I had a dream one time, and that's okay. So another supernatural thing <laughs> that my family deals with is is dreams. Yeah. My sister, my baby sister, she can see colors on people before they die. Uh, we're all plagued with uh, our vices. You know, uh, all five kids are. Um, 
But we all, you know, me and my older sister, definitely. Uh, if something is coming, we'll generally have a dream about it. And I, I had a dream, and I don't know what kind of time limit we had. No, you're fine. But uh, I, had, I got all day. I, I had a dream one time, and I've had two, actually. When my friend Frankie passed, I dreamt that we was in a place called Pine Island, and, and it's in Florida. It's a beach. And uh, I was standing on the beach, and he's out on a jet ski circling around. Well, I, I can look down because I'm sort of up on like a, rab- a ravine part of the beach where it slopes up. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking down on him. You know, he's having a good time, and he's like, oh, come on in, man. There's another one over there. Get on it, and let's, 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 let's play. And uh, I'm like, all right. So I seen this huge shark circling underneath him. And I'm like, uh, Frankie, y- get out of the water. You know, it's, it's, this thing's going to get you. I mean, it was like a great white shark. I mean, it was a- as big as a trailer. And this thing was huge and it was just circling right underneath his jet ski because he was sort of just putting along waiting on me. And so he's like, oh man, come on. I said, get out of the water. And so I turned my head to the left to look to see if I could get somebody to help. And I looked back, his jet ski was still going around in a circle, but he was gone and the shark was gone. It was probably two weeks after that he died. And I was going to call him and warn him to be real careful, and but I didn't do it. And I, I regret that to this day. Mm-hmm. And then on the same beach, this was years later, uh, me and my wife was on the beach. I mean, this is a dream. And I looked out across, and, and the beach was like, had all kind of trash on it. And it was just, uh, you know, seagulls were eating all this trash. And there was people out there that was, uh, it was extremely lascivious, should I say. I mean, I understand when you go to the beach, you're going to wear a bikini, you're going to, you know, but I'm talking about, this is like over the top, mm-hmm. almost like debauchery type stuff, you know, what's going on. And so I looked out in the ocean and I seen this crest. It was probably, it looked like it was 20 miles away. And something in my head said, it was the same voice I heard when I was a little kid that said, leave, get down the stairs. It said, take your wife and run. And I, I looked at it and it was, I seen it getting a little closer. It was this crest. And I thought, my gosh, that's a huge wave. So I looked at my wife. I said, run. So I turned her around. I didn't, I didn't even explain it. I just kept pushing her. And we got to the bottom of this uh, little hill, and it went up to the road. And I'm pushing her the whole time, and I could hear the water behind me coming. And about the time that I reached the top, I could feel the water hit the bottom of my feet. And I turned around, and the beach was just like glass. The, 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 the sand wasn't brown anymore. And dirty looking, it was immaculately white, like snow. And the seagulls were just flying around. There was no people. It got everybody. Probably about two years after that is when that tsunami hit. Indonesia? In Indonesia. And it maybe not have been two years, and it killed all those people. I I don't know. I wasn't told that to probably warn anybody, Mm -hmm. but it was like, okay, this is, I'm going to use a dream to show you what's probably going to happen. Well, what's going to happen. And I didn't understand the dream because I'm like, you know, when I first had it, I'm like, I know something's coming. Mm -hmm. It's a, some kind of a a natural disaster of some sort. Uh, You know, it has to do with water, obviously, but I didn't know where, how, you know, I was, I was oblivious to that. So it was, uh, it was pretty intense you want to you want to hear a story about that that tsunami um there was it it came in and everybody knows it it killed a lot of people Mm -hmm. uh but there was uh and i I heard this story a long time ago it's it's been a long time since that thing happened Uh, but there was a pastor out there in a boat with uh people from his congregation and this tsunami came in they were gonna die and he prayed against it and the waves went around them. Yep. And they survived it. Yep. And it's a, it's a story that goes unpublished. I I don't even know I don't I don't even know where I can find the guy. It's, so that really happened? Really happened. Wow. Really happened. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I didn't talk to the guy, but this is what I was told uh when it happened. I forget where I heard it. Uh somebody told me that. And they they said uh, it, it was just like the waves just kind of like engulfed everything around them. And they just were protected. That is, it's incredible. It is, it's, 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 it's unbelievable how God will uh, warn and protect His people, uh, even when you're not. 
what you would consider, I'm super holy. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not, uh, you know, it's, it's, he's not looking for a perfect person. Yeah. He's just willing for, he's looking for a willing vessel that will attempt to do what he's going to tell you, what, what he tells you to do. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and I mean, the, the blood, don't get me wrong, the blood of Christ is applied to everything. If without that, we're, you know, and I know that's politically incorrect to say, but, <laughs> but that's just the way it is. Uh, there was another one that I had. And this was, uh, you, you know, you know the basically the collapse of two thousand eight, yes. two thousand nine. Yes. So I had this dream that, and this I had this dream in like two thousand seven, and uh, I was in Lenor, you know, in Lenore City, and I was in the back of this pickup truck with all of my wife's family, and uh, there was these tornadoes, these gray tornadoes, and most of the time, if I'm dreaming about some kind of calamity or something it's going to have a tornado involved. Mm. And I don't know why, but that's, that's how it's, it's either a black tornado, which is like imminent, or it's uh, some like a gray that's not really pertaining to taking life, but it's trouble, trouble on the horizon, massive trouble. So we're, we're, we're across <clears throat> the interstate and we're looking down into Lenore City from a, from a, uh, a little uh, gas station, you know, off, off the interstate called bimbos and um we're sitting in the back of the truck looking at these massive tornadoes i mean they're huge and they are at all these businesses and they're and they're they're at all these businesses and uh um, you need to take that okay and so we're 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 looking at this and so i get off the uh i get out of the back of the truck and so i'm running down to these tornadoes so i go over to where one of these businesses at and this tornado is just spinning and I, uh, I put my hand and my arm inside the tornado and it never messed with me, but it destroyed that business. And I'm like, I pull my hand back out and I'm, they're, they're screaming, you know, man, get out of there, get out of there. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. So I'm, I put my, my arm all the way in and I'm like, it's not here for us. It's here for these businesses. And so I went over to another business and it just wiped it off the foundation. And it's still standing there just spinning. And I'm like, it's just here for the businesses, man. And so they come down and we're, we're driving in between all these pillars of tornadoes at these businesses. We're on the, on the main road that takes you through Lenore City. And so we get to this one business and this, it's, uh, this tornado is at this, at this business and it's, it's just absolutely leveling it. So I jump out of the back of the truck again and I see it coming across the road toward this little shop so i wanted to go and warn the people um that this thing's coming you don't want to be in that business when it hits Mm -hmm. because you're going to have to suffer its destruction Uh, obviously it's the financial destruction yeah and so and it was a dentist office so i go in and i'm telling these people get out of here get out of here get out of here you know i'm trying to warn them and be you know get ready for this and um they wouldn't listen so it starts to hit the building so i grab them and I throw everybody to the ground and jump on top of them. And I'm holding them down. And this thing hits and it levels the building. And I'm like, I get up and everything's like, you know, if you ever watch Twister, you know, it's like, yeah. just you see debris flying, just floating away. And uh, I woke up. And so I told Lisa, I told my wife, I said, I believe that there's, I said, I believe that there's uh, like a financial calamity that's coming. And I said, we need to get ready. I said, it's uh that's what I hear as I'm waking up because that's when I hear the meaning of the dream is like when I'm waking up, I don't know if anybody ever does that, but that's when I hear it. It all sort of comes to me. And she was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. We need to save up some money. You know, at the time she wasn't a, you know, yeah, she was in a different business and we didn't have a lot, but we started saving up. And, uh, it wasn't long after that, uh, the, the whole economy. Mm-hmm. Oh, and one thing I did do the next morning is I went out to this business, like I'm awake now and I'm, I literally drove out and there was this dentist office and I looked through the window and it was exactly what I seen in my dream, mm. everything. And I didn't even know that it was over there. Did it survive the crash? Uh, I don't know. I didn't yeah. go check. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that crash was, was tough. I, I got married, uh, June 2nd, 2007. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm new, newly married, and all of a sudden, like, it seems like the world's crashing down around me. Yep. I remember 
I remember sitting at my parents' house. He had, my dad had uh, all his siblings over, my aunts, uncles. Uh, I think my grandparents were there too before they died. Um, and uh, they they were talking to me and my wife, uh, you know, has married life and my cousins are there. Big family get together. And I'm not good at faking. I'm not mm-hmm. good at pretending. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Yep. I, I am what I am. And they're saying, how's life? And I'm like, <laughs> it sucks. Yeah. I, I have a wife I have to take care of. I didn't finish college. I have no hope of getting a good job. Right. I'm working in a, in, a, in, a, in a car garage as a general service technician because that's all I can freaking get. Right. You know? And it, it, it was like such desperation. I remember crying in front of everybody and everybody's quiet and I was embarrassed and I was just like, yeah, I'm sorry. I, it's just, you know, you guys asked me how things are going and, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to survive. Yep. And, uh, and I said, I'm not asking for a handout. I never asked for a handout. Not right. one time. Right. The only ever time, only time in the last 20 years of, oh, 20 years, it's not 20 years, 15 years of my marriage um, is uh, when my son was turning one, I was so broke. I, I was about to lose my house. Mm-hmm. I was, while I had this, this podcast, I was a year into podcasting, two years into podcasting. And I was so broke. I had no money. And uh, I asked my dad for $200 to help pay for my son's birthday. And I was ashamed of myself. Right. I was ashamed of myself. And he's like, you don't need to be ashamed of that. You know? Yeah. And I think that's a thing that, you know, men, uh, I know we're going from subject to subject. That's what the show is, man. I just talk. I just talk. But as a man, you know, we, we uh, internalize things mm-hmm. and we keep everything bottled in because that's the stress. You know, you, you, if you're sick, you go to work. Yeah. Because that's how you're going to pay the bills. You know, yeah. if, 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 the, if the economy's crashing, it falls on your shoulders, you know, and that's, we take that responsibility because that's what we were taught. And uh, that, that is, you know, because that's sort of our job mm-hmm. as, is to worry about these things. Make sure, you know, our kids are, I got 131 now and or 30, 31. And then I got another one that's, that's, 28 29 and they both have excellent jobs but it's i will always just because your kids grow up and your dad got that too whatever they need it's not even a question because i know how hard it is Mm -hmm. i know the struggles and the and the the worry and that you sit up at night and the and the frustrations and I, i i don't want my boys to ever have to endure that i don't care what i've got to do yeah uh, I, I don't want them to carry that massive burden that I had to carry at a mm-hmm. young, young age like you and, uh, and, and have to, you know, deal with that alone because that's the same way I was raised, you know, being in the mountains, that's, you took it on, you handle it, you know, but there is, uh, you know, and, and in knowing that I guarantee you, you're going to look at your child and you're going to be like, whatever you need, you just let dad know. Cause I don't want you going through what I had yeah. to go through. Yeah. That's the way I feel. I mean, I, I I, even with my kids now, I mean, I grew up real poor in a trailer park mm-hmm. and, um, uh, I, I don't want to have brats and I don't have, I don't want to spoil my kids, but at the same time, I don't, I don't want to manufacture tough times for them because Mm-mm. I want to teach them lessons. Mm-mm. Listen, I worked my butt off and I still do. And I want to just be able to provide a better lifestyle than my kids, uh, to my kids than I ever had, you know? Exactly. But I'm not afraid of going back to the trailer either. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's funny. My once once I moved to Tennessee, a lot of things changed with me, mm-hmm. a lot, and I feel like it's because uh, I feel like I've reached the promised land almost. Like this is where I want to be buried. Right. I will never live anywhere else. I chose to live here. A job didn't bring me here. Mm-hmm. I chose to come here. I didn't have to. I wanted to be here desperately. That's awesome. And I'm never leaving. Um, and that and I I say that because like everything that I do and I'm building right now. If for whatever reason it comes crashing down, I think at this point, um, the way it would crash down is if I do something crazy, like you know, cheat on my wife or something. I think I think a lot of my audience would leave me for that, mm-hmm. you know, and rightfully so. Um, or maybe the economy just totally just crashes, you know, which probably is going to happen. Uh, either way, um, I told my wife, and she's on board with this. I said we will sell whatever we got to sell off. And we'll get a trailer and a piece of land next to a river. And that's where we're going to live. I will never, ever go back to uh, what I came from, which was <clears throat> driving a tractor trailer 14 mm-hmm. hours a day mm-hmm. and never seeing my kids, somebody else in charge of my schedule. It, like I value so much being able to see my kids whenever I say I'm going to see my kids. Yeah. Because I mean, 
my son's first, I think it's his first birthday. It was like in the middle of the week or something like that. And uh, I, I, I said to work, I was like, hey, it's my kid's birthday today. I, I want to go home at a decent time. Mm-hmm. You know, can I, can I get home by five today? That's yeah. literally, you know, you, you drive a truck, you know how it is. Permission. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're like, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. No. I ain't no. doing that. No, my kid, my kid went to bed that night without seeing me. Oh, man. Yeah. And that's, that's the bad thing is, is when you, when you work for the man, mm-hmm. you know, that's, it's, uh, you know, I, I would rather, and, and one of the reasons that my wife went in the profession that she did was the fact that she controls her hours and what she makes. Mm. And basically I'm there for insurance. Mm, perfect. And, 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 uh, so if, if the economy ever does go insane, you can always come out to the barn, dude. <laughs> no, sounds good. That's why, that's why I invited you out here. I knew you had a barn. I just instinctively knew it. And we got one side. We got one side. Of, we got three bathrooms. We got all kind of stuff. Oh, in that's that cool. Thing, I, I wanna, this sounds cool. I want to check it out just to see what it is. Yeah, man. Because when we came in here, you said how much you spent on it. I was like, holy crap, that thing. And I, I just, we passed over it, but I was thinking, that must, that must be immaculate. Well, well we're, right now we're, we're putting in, uh, we're, we're going to put central heat and air into the main area which is about three thousand square feet mm. just an open room and it's you know 30 foot ceilings Jeez. and so uh, we're, we're we're dropping wow an astronomical amount of money just I, doing the walls and the ceilings and all that kind of stuff you know but yeah anyways listen we, let's wrap this up uh glenn i appreciate you uh coming out and it, it's very random you know i was like why don't you come out and you're like yeah. okay cool let's go <laughs> uh but before we we, we end here um and I don't know if this is the case or not, but you were talking about the barn and things that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you would like to promote and stuff as far as like advertisement at all? Or is, no. okay, I wasn't sure. I just want to make sure if there's a wedding venue that you want to promote. Like, yeah, if you want your wedding, can, can come out yeah. here. Okay, got you. That, then it, we're gonna keep it secret, and it will be the it will be the Noah ship, and uh, <laughs> I, I'll need your address before you leave. So. <laughs> definitely, yeah, we definitely want to have you out. <laughs> <laughs>